Good morning, Colorado. This is the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. It is April 28th and this is our weekly meeting. Um, we are going to let people, give people another minute or so to attend with us via Zoom. Appreciate the 24 folks that have logged in so far and climbing. And we'll start the roll call here in just a second. Hearings Manager Larson, the roll call. Yes, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Bove. Here. Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. Commissioner Hackett. Here. Commissioner McGowan. Here. Commissioner Mesner. Here. Commissioner Nanjapa. Here. Commissioner Robbins. Here. Mr. Chair, you have seven out of seven commissioners present. Great. Good to see everybody again. Um, welcome to another virtual Zoom meeting. Um, we have a packed agenda today, so we will roll into it. Um, the first item on the, on the agenda is report from director. Um, we've got our director with us and I spoke with her ahead of time and she said that she's busy with lots of things, but nothing of urgency to report. Shaking of head, Director Murphy, is that right? Okay. Um, so we've dispensed with director report. Um, we now will move to general public comment. We have nine folks that signed up by our deadline yesterday at noon. Uh, each person will receive three minutes for public comment. And we look forward to receiving that public comment. Uh, if you get to your three minutes and you're not done, I will suggest time and we would ask that you wrap up. Um, with that, uh, hearings manager Larson, I have Janice Hollowell, Stephen Douglas, and then Shana Oliver as the first three public commenters. Are any of those folks with us? Uh, we are checking right now, and I don't see our first um, commenter with us. We will see if uh, Mr. Douglas is with us. So if Ms. Amara would like to bring Mr. Douglas in, and we will go back and continue to look for Ms. Hallowell. And it looks like we do have Mr. Douglas. And Hold on. Oh, forgive me. Uh, hello? Hi. Yes, hello. Um, the hey. phone number that ends in 19, is that Mr. Douglas? Uh, yes, thank you for, for allowing me to, to speak because I'm on another Zoom call. Um, I just wanted to say real quick that, um, you know, through the course of this year and all, um, I, and then the, the issue of permits and all that, I think there needs to be accountability. And uh, I know it was addressed l last week about the whistleblower and all that. And I know you guys aren't a part of, you know, don't do any, have anything to do with that, but it all, it's all hand in hand and it all works together because one without the other and air, air monitoring, the right to have the right information for the public to, to know what's going on and for your division to know what's going on. So when you are going over these permits to be, to be accepted, you take everything in, uh, into account. So um, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Uh, who's next? Uh, hearings Manager Larson. Yes, next we have Ms. Oliver and in looking for her earlier, I did not see her. We'll see if I still don't see her. Um, we can we'll continue to go and look for Ms. Oliver and bring her in as soon as she joins the meeting. Uh, JD Royball is next on our list and he is in the meeting and we will bring him in. Mañana. Mañana. Good morning, Mr. Royball. We can hear you. One thing I'd like to say is 
during the weekend, it was really quite, there's a lot of stuff that came to, to pass. And I don't know if you watched the, in the interview between, or there was a discussion between Katie Porter. Now she slammed the fossil fuel executive, Mark Murphy. I, I'd suggest people take the time to look at that because it's really telling. I really believe people are starting to change their attitude. They're realizing that there's an active captive audience to the industry and I think things are kind of changing. I, I think it's a behoove you to be aware of that. And then <clears throat> I, I, one thing that I wanted to also mention is I noticed the comments is disabled. Here I was just bragging that you know here you afford us these opportunities. If we were actually sitting in a room we can com communicate between each other and things of that nature. We're actually tied to this system which is a Zoom event. So I would like you to consider keeping that comment section open because it is a form of communi communication that's allotted to us through this type of communica communication. Again, we'll just talk about that later. The last thing I would like to mention is I had mentioned about the mayor winds are not understanding what the red dots were, which are actual well sites. <clears throat> I think it's very important that this commission understands that what you, part of your job is to represent and protect the communities because some of the rural communities, they're captured. And if you actually go out east, you'll see some of the downtown, downtown areas, the buildings are collapsing. So we have an industry come up, come in and they come in there with their snake oil charm and, and do this thing. It's amazing that we actually need, and yes, I know I live in Windsor, but I have history in communal areas, commun, you know, rural areas. It's important that you understand that some of these folks don't really know what's going on. And part of, I believe your job is to do is to protect these rural areas and give them some of the education that's necessary. So they're not simply listening to one side. Thank you, Mr. Royball for participating with us and for your comments. Um, I would like to address uh, your contention that we should have the chat uh, or the comment section open during our meetings, and I disagree wholeheartedly with you. Um, we um, provide ample opportunities for members of the public to provide us their perspective. Anybody can provide public comment at each meeting for three minutes. Anybody can also provide written comment uh, at any time, and each commissioner has an open door policy. Our phone numbers and our emails are online, and you can comment to us directly. Um, I think that it's actually interruptive and intrusive to have folks provide public comment um, while someone else is speaking. I much rather desire to listen to the people that have appropriately signed up. So thank you for your perspective on that. Um, I disagree. I think my fellow commissioners are on board with me and I think we actually are providing more opportunity for public engagement with this commission than any previous historic commission. Um, we're here uh, eight to five, Monday through Friday, and we're available for comments. So thank you for your comments. Uh, we'll move to our next um, commenter. I believe that Ms. Oliver is now with us. Yes, she is. We will bring her in. Mr. Chair, I know we we pushed the button to bring Ms. Oliver in. I'm not seeing her populate though in the panelists. Um, apologies, we may have had a technical glitch. Um, Ms. Hollowell is also in the meeting. We could bring Ms. Hollowell in and then uh, retrieve Ms. Hol Oliver as soon as she comes back. Good morning, morning. Ms. Hollowell. Hello. Yes, we can, we can see you and we can hear you. We look forward to hearing from you. Great, thank you. Good morning and thanks for being here. You know, um, I wanted to talk, take a step back today and look at perspective just a little bit on this, um, just to kind of review where, how we got here. And um, 
So in 2008, John Hickenlooper and Barack Obama stood on the stage at the Democratic Convention in Denver, and they talked about transitioning to clean green energy and how Colorado would lead the way. Then Colorado ramped up fracking without fully understanding what the consequences to health and humans and animals and environment would be. It became an industry, industry standard to make sure that oil and gas profits were protected. Hickenlooper drank fracking fluid to reassure us bogusly that fracking was safe and anyway only a bridge to those clean green fuels. The industry boomed in our state. In 2010, my family moved to a farm in unincorporated West Boulder County where upslope winds blow from the northeast and temperature inversions hold pollutants from the fracking fields against the foothills for everyone to breathe. In 2013, my daughter was diagnosed with CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia, the equally deadly sister to AML. Eight difficult and sad years later, we're scrambling to, to make the transition from oil and, grass and we, oil and gas and we find ourselves with a huge mess to clean up the oil and gas industry is failing and we're beginning to understand the grave health risks of benzene, methane, co um, CO2, and other fracking chemicals. AML is now listed as one of the diseases caused from benzene. We are finally, late but finally, starting to move toward green energies. But we are left with 60,000 abandoned wells, all leaking the chemicals that cause cancer, headaches, respiratory problems, and cognitive problems in children. And the data isn't even all in on this. These chemicals blow all over the front range, not just within 1,500 feet or 2,000 feet of wells. And now we're starting to get it that plugging the wells is going to cost us over $7 billion. So I implore you, stop issuing permits. Just stop the drilling. Just end fracking in Colorado. End it now on public land and on private land make oil and gas pay to clean up their abandoned wells, create new jobs to find responsible and more effective ways to plug abandoned wells and create new jobs to get them plugged. Create jobs by cleaning up the soil around the well sites. The details of financial assurances must be rewritten to reflect your commitment to your mission. We don't have time for empty promises, hesitation or compromises that fall short of protecting public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources. The fact is, we now know that even if we cut all the emissions to zero, we aren't going to save ourselves and our planet. We have to actually put carbon back in the ground. The way I see it, the miles of oil and gas wells provide an opportunity to put carbon in them as part of the plugging process. If we develop new better practices for plugging wells and remediating soil around the wells, we can actually sequester carbon, something we have to do anyway, while stopping emissions. This should There's be a new- well, well, time, if you could try to wrap up. I'm wrapping up. This could be a new robust industry, the sequestering of carbon and the plugging of abandoned wells. We owe it to ourselves to do this. We owe it to the planet. The technology exists. Please be an expansive in your thinking about alternative well plugging practices and then test and implement them. It's imperative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hollowell, for being with us this morning and for your comments. Mm -hmm. Hearings Manager Larson, I believe we have Ms. Oliver with us now. Yes, we do. Hello. Good morning, Ms. Oliver. Can we can hear? hear you. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Shana Oliver. Um, I am a field organizer with Equal Madres, Moms Clean Air Force, uh, Colorado chapter, as well as being an indigenous advocate for indigenous people's rights, our right to clean air, water, and lands, as well as having an equitable um, solutions to our communities for health, education, nutrition, um, housing, as well as employment. Um, these policies have been the, the reasons why we're where we're at, the reason why we have um, the Indian Removal Act that committed genocide on my people, myself, my family, and continues with these policies that allow to continue the, the extortion, the exploitation of our, of our ancestral lands for oil and gas. And um, we know now that um, science aligns with indigenous people's voices that we cannot keep going on with these resources as as we are um, 
we have seen the devastation on our communities with COVID, as well as um, disproportionately in, um, impacted community members like Commerce City, North Adams area, unincorporated Adams. Um, these areas are predominantly um, occupied by Black, Brown, um, Indigenous, Latino, as well as the transient um, low-income people that have moved in these neighborhoods and thought they would be safe and free from all the, the worries that they moved away from, like, from back east. And it, it's not so if, if this is what we continue to do is ignore the people and our concerns of our environmental well-being as well as health that we need to um, actually address and your department actually needs to align with the state law of climate um, plan action to reduce our greenhouse gases. And, um, and this is appalling that you're still continuing to push forward with oil and gas in predominantly um, disproportionately impacted community members such as black community that are predominantly live in and near unincorporated Adams County. And this is a continued environmental injustice with no accountability for these oil and gas um, permits to hold accountability for their orphan wells when they're done with them. Who will pay the cost for, for these wells when they're done with our communities? Um, so that's why we need to move away from um, exploiting our community resources um, and actually protect our communities and our well-being and our health so that our children can thrive um, with a future ahead of them. And so I ask you to please deny um, these proceedings of going forward of allowing oil and gas in unincorporated Adams County. I think it's very appalling that um, you're still not heeding to the, to the community concerns of economic well-being and health. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oliver, for being with us in your comments. I believe we now have Rana Sanchez. Good morning. Um, first, I would like to acknowledge that um, I do agree with you. We've been given plenty um, opportunities to address you and I do appreciate that. Um, I'm here to urge you to please take into account the health and safety of Colorado residents as you move forward. I'm a leukemia survivor, I had AML, and I'm very aware of what negatively impacts people's health and it has been scientifically proving that, proven that fracking does just that. It's not good for people, and despite what the oil and gas companies want you to believe, it is not safe for people to be around oil and gas sites. I moved to Commerce City two years ago, and prior to that, I lived in Greeley for 30 years, so I'm very familiar with oil and gas. <clears throat> it sickens me to think about what extraction oil did to Bella Romero. Originally, they were planning to drill in West Greeley near Frontier Academy, a predominantly white school where the city manager's child attended, and then all of a sudden they changed their mind and decided to drill in East Greeley near a predominantly Hispanic school where the city manager's child did not go to school. We all know what's going on there. Extraction site provided Bella Romero students and staff elevated benzene exposure, a known carcinogen. While SB 19181 rulemakings in 2020 were a significant step in the right direction, much more action is needed to protect Coloradans. Colorado is still not requiring continuous monitoring of emissions at oil and gas sites, so most communities are unaware of the levels of toxic emissions to which their families are being exposed to. Colorado continues to permit additional fracking despite the fact that most of the Front Range has F-grade air quality and is serious and non-attainment of ozone standards. In this time of COVID-19, which is made worse by air pollution, Colorado needs to put the brakes on new fracking and stop approving new drilling permits. Coloradans need to focus on protecting their health and families. They should not be distracted by having to respond to new oil and gas drilling proposals in or near their communities. Focus needs to be on adopting stronger safeguards for Colorado's health, environment, and safety. 
Until the above issues are meaningfully addressed, we ask that you pause all permitting and oil and gas operations. Thank you. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and all the opportunities that you've been afforded us, affording us. Thank you, Ms. Sanchez, and thank you for the kind words. I uh, appreciate your being with us this morning. Um, we now have Renee Chacon. Mr. Chair, I don't know if Renee knows she's on mute. Can you hear me? There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McGowan. Good morning. Buenos dias, Cuadritlanetsi. My name is Renee Malarchacon. I'm a mixed indigenous woman with ancestors from Southern Colorado, New Mexico. And most importantly, I'm a mother of two sons in this space. I'm determined to be a good ancestor for them in social justice and climate justice for the rest of my life. We do live on the land of the Ute, Arapaho, Cheyenne, Hickory, Apache, Navajo, and Comanche people, and the surviving generations, both urban and rural, the thousands of indigenous descendants of the 48 tribes that traveled through Denver. I constantly am on these to remind you to please be good ancestors, because if we had, we wouldn't be having to suffer and still survive these forms of public endangerment. Do you understand? what extractive industries are currently and still doing in predatory capitalism to the land you call Commerce City, Colorado. Yes, Suncor is and continues to repeatedly violate air pollution in disproportionate communities and has fought so many reporting requirements and modifications of its permits that it still continues to refine dirtier tar sands oil, releasing toxins of benzene, hydrogen cyanide, and hydrogen sulfide. To this day, I still suffer from anemia. My son now has almost daily nosebleeds. Being this type of dangerous to our, public, to our public health, I'm asking you to please stop. We are people that we understand where you're failing us and we're tired of extractive corporations that are given, given the privilege to vent in front of us. They should be held as moral people and held with further violence and environmental crimes when they're committed on public and land. Reducing statewide harmful pollutants can no longer just be part of healthcare concerns, but needs to be part of our healthcare access now. We need to have fines, but most of all, we need to know where unregulated flares and plumes are harming us and the who, what, when, where, and why we're being harmed. We have not had representation in the way we've needed, and we need the efforts to ensure community engagement and monitoring plan has been developed, ensured in accessible meetings, thorough translation services, and ample opportunity for public comment. Further confining us socioeconomically to places lacking the environmental necessities of life is blatant environmental racism and targeting. And this has been more than enough cause for accountability and consequences from this public endangerment. We're tired of marginalized and black communities experiences this degradation further now as nausea, headaches, asthma, childhood leukemia, and babies born at low birth rates. We have the right to know the particulate pollution. We know that pain is optional, but we know that pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Please understand that those that have suffered from COVID, I've worked from the front lines past the speech. Those that have suffered from COVID are severely dying in these spaces, are severely having lack of access to these spaces. I deliver food share to our elders three to four times a week and I can't help them. This is getting to the point that they sit on these meetings, they hear how they can help, and nothing's being done in time to save them. This is why I sit on these every day. It's more than just for my kids. It's seeing my elders die where I'm not gonna be able to record what knowledge they'll have to help us save these spaces anymore. And I'm also not gonna be able to have them here another year. I ask that you take action in a more timely way. And most of all, I ask that you protect that can protect yes. Most of all, I ask that you have the courage and humility to recognize this is a harm that even though you're not experiencing, the, those that we love are experiencing every day that we can't protect them from. Understanding that it's time for transparency, monitoring, and most of all, redistribution of wealth by the corporations that we know have harmed us. Thank you for today. Thank you, Ms. Chalkon. 
I believe we now have Marie Venner. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you, Ms. Benner. Okay. I'm a former commissioner mom and from an ag family on one side, so from rural areas, and I'm co-chair of a Colorado Business Association. But today you might care that I've spent most of my career in cost-benefit analysis for the public sector and around critical infrastructure. So please hear me when I say that this industry needs to begin annual contraction and certainly no more permitting. This is essential on sheer simple cost benefit terms for our state. Remaining on the current path is to abandon your responsibilities under the law and put our state in great danger. If you do the right thing, you'll be able to tell your kids and grandkids about it with pride. You will have done hard things, as we often credited the greatest generation, and you will be the ones who showed courage head on instead of ducking. Harvard research doctors are the latest to confirm that one in five deaths are caused by fossil fuel emissions. Air pollution contributes greatly to many major categories of deaths, including strokes, heart attacks, dementia, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's. And they've been able to analyze now to the extent to determine, you know, um, which of these is actually caused by uh, fossil fuel emissions. Um, another interesting study uh, is of children and teens who died who live in more polluted areas. And they've been found to have brain damage, physical brain changes caused by pollution that are similar to those problems we associate with the end of life. Air pollution is a noteworthy factor in autism too, and my son is on the spectrum. My mother is on a high level of oxygen, and I'm one who can really tell and experiences chest pain on our high ozone days. I learned this past week that black people and poor people are 80 to 100 times more likely to live near pollution sources. The law requires consideration of cumulative impacts, and that has not been occurring. Please, please, we can only tell ourselves stories about being able to continue permitting further fossil fuel production when the whole world is telling us the, um, that the amount of production needs to decrease annually. We can only do this so long. That time is now. Please stop pretending our lives depend on it. The ability to farm and live in Colorado depend on it. Your job is to project, protect the health and safety of Coloradans now and in the future, full stop. To do this, you have to stop new permitting and wind down this industry. To protect our climate, health, safety, air and water resources and frontline communities and all of us in this highly polluted area, Colorado needs to rapidly phase out fracking, especially in this time of unprecedented concern due to COVID-19. And I lost another friend uh, to that last weekend. Um, this is worsened by air pollution and the state needs to put people first. Please bring existing wells up to full closing coverage. There should be an annual fiscal review and coverage of, of closing old wells from fees in a trust fund. Please require full funding. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Venner, for being with us and for your testimony this morning. I believe we now have Guillermo Serna. Hello. Yes, hello, we can hear you. Yes, sir, Guillermo Serna. Commerce City, Colorado. Um, as I hear this morning that possibly the Attorney General will be doing an investigation on all of this because of the whistleblower and not accepting what that whistleblower is doing, you know, in perspective to the, not getting him to be able to be safe. Okay, now if, if, if that's going to happen. Hello? We can hear you.
Mr. Cerna, you've muted yourself. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you again. Okay. If that's going to happen, then how can we keep going in these sessions? Because we really don't know what's happening with the oil companies and everything that's coming with it. Last night, something happened to me with our county in a county meeting in perspective to information to the community. They couldn't answer questions really to water. I was told that water was gonna be reusable, but what they didn't tell me was the fact that it's not usable to human beings for use of drinking water in perspective to our safety. And that bothered me quite a bit because we still have a lot of drought here in Colorado. And you know, there's a lady there that has a tree in back of there, okay? It's a beautiful tree and we're destroying it. We're getting more and more fires and those trees, if that tree was right, that would be about maybe three, four, maybe a thousand years old sometimes. But it was because they were able to grow with clean air. We're destroying our earth and I concur with everything that was said by the indigenous in perspective to how they feel about earth. And when it, we got here, everything was green. Go out east and look at what's there. It's not green anymore. Lack of water. Animals are drinking it. We talk about environment, how we want to save this and save that, but yet we don't learn from the past. We have to start looking at the cities and different needs of each county or city or location. We were here and it was done. So it it brings me the question why do we continue if we're not, we don't have any continuity between the state the counties the cities and the people the most important thing we're going to be growing and there's no rules and regulations as to how much water can be used all they do is use it and then they leave it on ponds when river, if you drink water from a river that's running good, okay, well, it's safe to drink. But when you leave it standing there, millions and millions of, of, of tons of water, or however they, they measure it, it doesn't work. And, and I'm hoping that you take a look at this before, and they're going to be making this decision. Mr. Cerna, you're out of time, if you could wrap up. Okay. I'm hoping that you make this decision before the county makes their decision as to what's going on. There's some good there, but the bad outweighs the good. So please take a look at this before you make any decisions and make it or stop it until everything is clear because we're just wasting money one way or the other. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Serena, for participating with us this morning and providing your comment. I believe Mr. our last public commenter is Christy Douglas. Thank you. I just got the message uh, to let me know how I could unmute. Sorry, I have to be on a phone. Uh, my name's Christy Douglas. I come to you as a concerned citizen uh, from Commerce City in Adams County and um, uh, a mom, a grandmother. 
and an activist in the community. Um, I also serve as the uh, co-chair for NRCC, which is North Range Concerned Citizens, but I um, am speaking on my own behalf this week. Again, I would like to uh, say thank you for l allowing us to come to you and speak on a weekly basis. Um, it uh, <laughs> It is tiring, but I can tell you that it's important um, that you hear from us weekly. So I do want you to know that we absolutely appreciate it. So last week um, I brought up the uh, the whistleblowing situation with the CDPHE and it seemed like I kind of hit a nerve with that. And I wanted you to know that I was not insinuating that the COGCC had anything to do with that situation or was aware of the fact that there was anything going on to cause whistleblowing. Um, so I just really wanted you to know that. And then, um, I don't know where else to go from here except that I really echo the words of everyone else who spoke earlier today. I do see on the agenda that you are discussing an MOU with Weld County. Adams borders Weld and whatever happens in Weld and they seem to think that Weld will collapse if they don't have oil and gas production there, their economy. They put the economy first and that's, that's not right. Um, so whatever this MOU is, I'm going to be watching it. We can see the brown cloud <laughs> building constantly from up north from where I live. And I hope that you don't give them uh, more credence than they already have in, in allowing them to do whatever they want and set their own rules. Because now everyone's saying that you are not the floor and that that local jurisdictions can do whatever they want and set, set their own rules. And that's not the intent of 181. I want you to keep that in mind. So I don't know what's happening here, but I can tell you that I don't like it. That's all I have for you today. Again, I appreciate the fact that you let us speak every week. Um, and um, that's it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Douglas. Um, uh, would encourage you to indeed stay tuned and listen into our discussion about the proposed Weld MOU. Um, it's a process document, um, and I believe it is uh, appropriate. We'll look forward to having that discussion later today. Um, I do have Commissioner Hackett, uh, who is the CDPHE representative with us um, last week. I just wanted to clarify the record. There was some ins insinuation that the whistleblowing was with regard to our agency, COGCC, and that's not the case. Um, would invite Commissioner Hackett if he has anything to say relevant to that. I'm just trying to keep uh, perspective on who we are and what we're doing uh, versus our sister agency. Commissioner Hackett. Thank you, Chair Robbins. And yes, you absolutely are correct. The whistleblower complaint that uh, public commenters have referenced does concern allegations of wrongdoing or misconduct by employees of the Air Pollution Control Division, which is within the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, um, an entirely separate and distinct body from the COGCC, which is in, within the Department of Natural Resources. Um, that being said, at the same time, all of us, all commissioners, I think I speak for commissioners at the COGCC, I think I speak for staff um, at CDPHE and at COGCC, we're all very interested in this issue. We all share air. We all share responsibility for protecting public health and environment. So we're all very um, eager to find the outcome of this investigation. Um, just to be clear, some of the comments that were made this morning concerned the recent news reports from yesterday. I think Colorado Public Radio ran a story about Attorney General Phil Weiser calling for an independent investigation of the allegations in the whistleblower complaint. Um, to be clear, that is there's two processes that will happen. There will be um, an investigation of those allegations 
by the federal United States Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Inspector General. And what Attorney General uh, Phil Weiser called for yesterday would be a separate investigation. Um, that's not going to be conducted by his office or anyone affiliated with the state of Colorado or CDPHE. It will be an entirely independent investigator. Um, and that's not a way to, you know, sidestep the other process that the federal EPA will be conducting. Um, it's an indication, if you ask me, of, of, a, of our willingness to respond in a transparent and honest way in this process and participate in good faith. And also the attorneys that are actually representing the whistleblower has said as much. They think that it's a good idea that the attorney general has called for this second independent investigation. So we all look forward to the outcome of that. We hope it's expeditious. And I think we can all agree that we hope it's thorough and we hope it's a fair investigation. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to address that. Thank you, Commissioner Hackett. Um, I, I, and I think my fellow commissioners really appreciate your um, clarifying uh, the situation for us and providing some perspective for our stakeholders uh, to whom all of, you know, all of us would agree this is a very important um, uh, area to um, get to the bottom. So thank you again for that. Um, with that, uh, hearings manager Larson, I believe we have covered um, all public comment from folks that signed up. Is that accurate? Did we miss anybody? That is correct, Mr. Chair. All members who signed up have spoken. Awesome, great. Um, okay, we will continue in our agenda. And at this time, um, we will have a informational presentation from staff on interim and final reclamation. Um, for our stakeholders that are listening in, um, we have been engaged in these informational dockets to acquaint the commissioners as well as our stakeholders with processes around oil and gas development. Um, and today is the day in which we will hear from the esteemed Dr. Denise Arthur um, with regard to interim and final reclamation. Great to see you, Denise. Um, welcome. Thank you. All right, I'm and gonna share my if, screen. If you wanna start by way of, yeah, and you probably had this, but if you wanna start by way of providing some background about your employment with commission. I know you've been there for a while and uh, have a uh, important job with regard to reclamation. Um, yes, sorry. Let me switch this around. There we go. So I've been working for COGCC since 2014. We've been building um, our reclamation program with a very experienced and uh, passionate staff. Uh, I'm one of those passionate staff members and I'm very excited to be here today to talk about my passion, which is reclamation. Um, I do have a, a, a degree from CSU, a PhD in restoration ecology and then have been uh, doing this type of work for a very long time. This presentation is really gonna be an in, uh, like an introductory overview of reclamation for the commissioners. So I guess I'll just launch in. Let me grab my pen here. I do like to point at things. All right, so just a quick overview of what we're gonna talk about. We wanna talk about why reclamation is important, what kind of uh, goals we have for reclamation. I'll talk about my staff and where they're oriented on the landscape. What happens if there isn't proper reclamation? And we'll talk about the reclamation steps, what my staff does when looking at reclamation in the field. And then we'll talk about reclamation concepts, processes, and some of those challenges. So why is it important? We really wanna put our soil systems back together in order to build these uh, habitats back to, and put them back together for wildlife, agriculture, um, uh, and grazing. So that's why it's important. Some of these goals would include, so here's an area that had an oil and gas location and you can see that you can't determine where that is. Same with this bottom one. On the right, you'll see a project that I worked on, uh, it was a while ago for sure. But you can see this was a water pipeline that was going in in the forest um, up out, uh, outside of Netherland. So you can see staging areas. This is the after photo. You can see that that whole uh, disturbance has disappeared over time. 
because of proper and um, consistent reclamation and monitoring. This road is, is still here, as you can see here. So a lot, a lot of people ask the question, do in this Southwest where it's very arid actually get reclamation to uh, work properly? Here's an example of the Southwest, very arid area. Uh, one of my inspectors uh, wanted this to be reclaimed and uh, did an inspection, a corrective action inspection. And post that reclamation, you can see that it was put back together quite nicely. Here's a road that goes this direction, it's bare. Again, that was 2016. By 2020, the road has a good vegetation cover. So goals are, we, need to, we really want to go beyond just replanting. We need to really um, have an integrated set, uh, functioning below and above ground. We want to create self-sustaining, desirable plant communities, create ecological functioning states. We want to uh, return the topography back to pre-disturbance. We want to replace that topsoil and those soil profiles so that we can have this above and below ground processes working properly. We want to restore functioning cropland. We want to do weed management. And we want to enhance these habitats after disturbance for wildlife. So here's an overview of where my staff reside. Uh, you can see there are two folks here on the West Slope, uh, down in the Southwest. Over here um, is Ryan. This uh, one location here uh, in blue is vacant, but we're hoping to fill that fairly soon. And then Chris uh, has this area up here, but at the moment he's covering the whole area. So what happens if there isn't proper reclamation? Uh, erosion, you can see a severe erosion here and all, and all that soil ended up down below. Compaction issues and crop growth if it's not done properly, erosion. This is an interesting uh, surface owner wasn't too happy in this photo. This is where the, this is the drilling mud. It wasn't properly reclaimed and everything around it blew away. If we had had proper reclamation, this probably would not have happened. So we've lost all that soil. When you have improper interim reclamation, you have these large um, sites that have, uh, are not stable, bare areas. Um, Julie thought this was a, a meadow, but it's not. <laughs> Sorry, Julie. <laughs> This is a four foot tall annual weeds, this green here, field bindweed, bare areas. So we're gonna start with just the steps. What are the steps for uh, final, I mean for reclamation? First, you wanna plan the location. A lot of this is done through 300 series. Uh, now the 300 series is asking for a top school salvage plan, stormwater plans, and interim reclamation plans. All this planning really helps up front when you're talking about reclamation down the road. Next step is, uh, I did, oh, one, one back. Uh, my staff will probably be looking at these and we're developing uh, guidance documents for the operators. So uh, a form 42 goes out to one of my staff members and they arrive at the location. They look at stormwater, topsoil salvage. They check the, two, the 2A compliance with the total disturb area. They look at uh, conditions of approval. Then there may be another, Staff that would, uh, this is prior to the well completion. Again, we look at these um, A through D here. We might look at these wildlife protections more closely at this point. So interim reclamation is going to be the next step, but what is interim reclamation? So here's your overview. Uh, this location is fairly large in the beginning. So then you have a couple of wells, you have your tank battery, and once that's done, um, well, you need this area in the beginning for frack tanks, parking equipment, so on and so forth. But once that's done, you should be able to shrink the location. So in blue, that would be considered your interim reclamation area. The area is not needed for production. So interim reclamation assessment, timing, stormwater, recontouring, decompaction. We'll talk about some of these specifically as we move forward. Uh, the location size, is it appropriate after the interim reclamation has been done? Only areas needed for production. Is there debris, waste, unused equipment, pit closures? So we cross over with 900, weed control, and then are those topsoils and stockpiles protected and stabilized properly? We also look at seed mixture. 
we look at the vegetation, whether that's crop or um, a rangeland situation, we'll do an assessment of the vegetation cover at that point to make sure that it has been properly reclaimed. And then again, we look at wildlife protection. Final reclamation. Final reclamation really looks at everything, that interim reclamation, with the addition of looking for the roads, flow lines, and removal of risers to be completed. So now we'll talk a little bit about this reclamation concepts, processes, and challenges. Topsoil is one of my passions when it comes to reclamation because it is so important uh, for the reclamation process. So here's an example. This was an orphan well uh, project. Uh, you can see in the front, it's all green. In the back, it's not. Uh, there's a too long to communicate why this was done this way, but this is all, uh, this had the topsoil behind. It was amended. We did soil sampling. Uh, we did all the right um, processes, but it didn't have any topsoil. And you can see that this is green and this is not. So what is topsoil? It is actually the soil that's on the top. Uh, there are different ways that we might look at that. What is the color? How do you compare it when you look at a soil profile, right? Up and down here, here's your soil profile. Look at color, look at, um, we look at the structure of the soil, and then we look at the type of soil we have here, the, um, whether it's a loam, a clay loam, so on and so forth texture. So why is it important? It really has all that, the topsoil is alive. It has all that microbial um, activity down below. Uh, it, it, it's going to improve your root development because it has the mycorrhizae. Uh, it has native seed sources, which in my past history has shown to be very beneficial. Nutrients, uh, both um, macronutrients and micronutrients. So how do we salvage it? How do we get that topsoil? A lot of times scrapers are used, dozers in certain situations, and we need to make sure we know how much the depth is before we start. And then um, once you're done with that, you are reclaiming, it's re likely gonna reduce your reclamation costs. Oh, one more thing about topsoil, it, it, it's very, uh, you can't replace it. It really does take a very, very long time to uh, create topsoil over time. Unused equipment. So what we look for when we're out in the field is like, it, uh, is there unused equipment that doesn't really need to be there? This is going to get in the way of your interim reclamation. So we want to make sure that this uh, is removed and your weed management for that matter. So we want to remove that equipment. Final reclamation, same thing. We need to make sure that um, during final reclamation, these are uh, sites that my inspectors visited where uh, we got a notice that said uh, final reclamation complete. So we've got to get rid of this uh, equipment before the final reclamation will pass. Decompaction, soil decompaction, a very, very important component of reclamation. The rule is 18 inches for decompaction and it needs to be cross ripped to 18 inches and we'll talk about why. So just a concept, uh, the soil composition as you can see here is 45% mineral, but most of the soil, 50% is either air or water. So we need to look at the soil structure. Um, it, if it's compacted, it'll affect your soil structure. It reduces this air and water, and this is going to result in soil health um, decreases and plant growth. So here's, a, again, another uh, schematic of the, the, the situation. When those soil particles are collapsed, you can see that your water and your soil or your air can't penetrate that soil any longer. Also, your roots. And you have this uh, situation where just driving over it can compact the soil to below 20 inches. So here you can see what, what is the result. Uh, it's very well researched, this, these compaction issues. If you have low compaction, uh, deep root depth, uh, this is a, a cropland species. Tall here, medium, the roots go down to here, not as tall. And then you can see a compacted area. You have almost uh, very little growth. And here you can see the crop didn't come in at all. How do we get that decompaction after it's been compacted for the oil and gas operations? 
We have large equipment. If you have enough horsepower, you can pull pieces of equipment like this through the soil. It cuts and lifts. Uh, dozers have what's called down pressure, and so we're going to do the decompaction with that down pressure. Seed mixers are the next thing we were, we're going to uh, look at when we're out there. I uh, just wanted to use blue grama because that is our state grass. I'm not sure everybody knows that. Um, and then buffalo grass is very common. So we want to create these uh, long-term self-sustaining plant communities and uh, that reflect your reference area forbs or, or um, flowers, uh, so on and so forth, shrubs and grasses. So those are our goals. So the way the rules work is if the uh, seed mixture, a specific seed mixture is requested by the service owner, that's what the operator needs to use, regardless of whether it matches the reference area at that point. Um, seed mixtures, otherwise, the operator needs to go to the soil conservation and get seed mixtures. You can see why native um, seed mixtures uh, do well because they have higher drought tolerance. You can see here's a common uh, plant that was used in reclamation. It's called smooth brome. The roots just go to here. And over here, I can't see it because you guys are there, but Kentucky bluegrass, if you can see that, is, um, I like to see it over here. That's your lawn, and you can see how uh, uh, short the roots are. So how do we get this done with the equipment? What's needed? Seedbed preparation is one of the first things you might want to look at. These are the different types of equipment. Fertilizer, this is only a fertilizer required. You might want to do a soil sample to determine that. This is what's called a hopper. I don't know if you can see those white flakes coming out. That's your fertilizer. In situations where you have topsoil, I typically do not recommend actually fertilizing. Here's your seeding equipment. So you have uh, different types of drills. I thought this might be interesting to folks. Uh, this type of drill has three seed boxes. The reason you might want that because seed has different architecture. It's either fluffy seed, large seed, small seed. Buffalo grass, for instance, has 56,000 seeds per pound. Blue grandma, 825, sand drop seed, like 5 million, right? So you want to have these different seed boxes so that you have a uniform distribution of your seed. Seed stabilization, seed bed stabilization, and erosion control once you've seeded it. You don't want to leave the soil out there just bare. It also retains mulch, retains moisture, adds carbon, stabilizes it for um, erosion, wind, and water. That's the seed bed and the seeds in the soil. What's mulch? So this is uh, what I've used over many years. Uh, this is long fiber weed feed grass. You can use uh, straw. It, you, this is, it rolls out and goes down onto the ground and then it's called, it's crimped with this piece of equipment. And in the end, this is what it looks like. So this is good stabilization and uh, this is a long fiber so it sticks up like this, it looks like grass. Erosion control blankets, that's another method for stabilizing your seed bed for erosion and good growth. Um, this is a project I worked on. You can see the road down here. This is a one and a half to one slope. We did have some checks in between and uh, this came in within a year actually. And this uh, jute mat stabilized that slope very, very well, if installed properly, of course. Wood mulch is an alternative being used. Uh, some of the beetle kill uh, folks started uh, chopping up. This light colored, kind of reddish color is the wood mulch itself. Doesn't work as well on steep slopes. Then of course you have hydro mulch. Many people have seen uh, this used on the roadsides and so on and so forth. It's another method. Some people like to use uh, manure. This is not recommended by staff. Um, it's very hard to get an even distribution. If it's not composted, it has many weeds. All of this green that you see in the foreground are weeds. And then you can see the bare areas where it's too thick, nothing can come through. And here you have a reference, this is the reference area just outside here, and you can see there are no weeds. So how do we make sure that it is uh, growing properly and everything is working? So we have this, pre-reclamation, this area was uh, a pre-reclamation area. And then we say, okay, well, did, did it meet the 80%? This is after. Uh, this is one of my projects again, down, uh, 
not on an oil and gas location, but you can see that you have uh, good growth here. So this is what staff will do to verify this 80%, which is in the thousand series rules for interim reclamation. We don't do this on every location if it's uh, an obvious pass, and my staff has a lot of experience with this. So what is that little piece of equipment here? How do we do this? It's called first hit point intercept method. We use a laser, it uh, projects down to the ground. We write down what, we, what it intercepts. Is that a grass? Is it bare ground? Is it rock? So on and so forth. We go along a hundred uh, foot transect line and stop every two feet and take a reading on both sides of this piece of equipment. This is an example of the, uh, of the sheet, the, the data sheet. We write down uh, the species here, um, what we saw, what was hit, we'll have a disturbed transect and a reference transect to try to figure out how things are going. Then cropland, how do we make an assessment of the cropland to see whether it should be released? So, uh, or it's good for interim or, or final for that matter. We need to look at density, not just density, but height. So you can see here, you, this is the uh, reference. It might have the same density as you have here, but obviously there's a height issue. So if it's not, if something's going on with the soil or if it's compacted, you may have the right number of plants, but they're not flourishing. Weed control is also very important as we go forward. So the weed infestations, um, not only are they obnoxious, they can inhibit desirable plant species growth and establishment. It can create debris. You can see one of my inspectors here. This is what happens. Uh, it, sometimes it blows across the road. Uh, there's Mike. There's Mike over here. Lots of weeds on the stockpile. This hard has is on a stick that's three feet tall. And this is all um, weeds down below. So weeds are important to control. So in wrapping it up, we want to create a stable ecologically functioning soil profile. We want to return these locations to ecologically functioning states. We want to create a self-sustaining native desirable plant community. And we want to restore these lands to productive agricultural systems. And that's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Arthur. Um, looking at commissioners, do we have questions? Commissioner Nanjapa and then Commissioner McGowan. I think I saw Commissioner McGowan's hand first, so I'll let her go first. That's fine. I couldn't see everybody. Go ahead, Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my questions are probably going to be much more rudimentary than Commissioner Nanjapa's. Um, when, we're talking about, when we're talking about soil, um, it, it, um, is it mostly that soil needs to be replaced and, and aerated, et cetera, because it's been compacted and or are there also issues with soil that's been contaminated and then it has to be replaced? So, and when you're talking about reclaiming the soil, um, are we mostly, from in most cases, are we just talking about coming in with special equipment that helps create that air again? And or are they bringing in fresh top soil because it's been degraded? So I guess I'm unclear a little bit about kind of how that all works. Um, thank you, Commissioner McGowan. Yes, uh, everything you said, uh, makes sense. So we have multiple situations. One would be putting those soil profiles back together um, in the order that they came out of the ground. So compaction is one issue that occurs during the disturbance process. So it, we, those, even those subsoils that are below the topsoil could be compacted. So those need to be um, uncompacted, which is going to add that air and water that you were talking about. And then you want to bring that topsoil back. Um, soil sampling may be important in many situations to determine uh, what needs to be done, if it has the right agricultural 
um, uh, analysis, which would be organic matter, and there's a whole suite of some of uh, analytes that you might want to look at for uh, the soil. Replacement soil has been done before when it's so contaminated that needs to be moved off. Uh, we do ask for if they're bringing in topsoil that they do a test and compare it to the reference soil so that they're not bringing in lower grade soil um, from somewhere else like fair to the surface owner if we have poor soil being replaced with what used to be good soil. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so it, sound, it sounds mostly to me like it's compaction issues and trying to get the so soil back to its natural state so that the things that normally grow there can grow. Yeah, that is, a, that is definitely a big factor. There would be some issues with salt um, if there were spills, but that would be a different situation where we would have to look at that because you couldn't get it to grow. But yeah, the, the topsoil would be piled separately. It, the subsoil would be decompacted, like you said, and then that topsoil would be brought back. Thank you. That was a really good presentation, by the way. It was very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nanchapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Arthur. That was great. I really appreciate all the information. Um, one thing that um, I uh, appreciated and, and just wanted to see if you could maybe delve into a little bit further was the root depths. Um, something that I had learned in some of my you know, work that, that those, as you, you highlighted, the smooth brome and the Kentucky bluegrass, which are technically invasive species, um, and you know how they are such short root depths. Um, and could you just explain a little bit more for, for everyone listening about why that matters? You know, with a little bit more um, color to that. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Japa. Yeah, I. Um, root depth is very important, and uh, these agricultural. Um, introduced species like the smooth brome and Kentucky bluegrass, uh, they haven't, uh, typically those were developed with irrigation. So in your drought ridden areas, especially in Colorado as being a semi-arid um, area, you want species that have deep roots. So when they die back, they can then recover with soil water that hasn't gotten to the surface and essentially um, evaporated. So we need those deep roots so that once uh, they start to grow again as a perennial, they have access to that water so that they can recover. And uh, they're also accessing uh, nutrients at depth as well as water. I'm not sure that answers your question. Yeah, no, it does. Thank you so much, Dr. Arthur. And I think, I think part of the reason I wanted you to just highlight that was that, um, you know, in, in some of these areas where the reclamation, you know, is, is attempting to restore the natural conditions that those seed mi mixtures are really important. Um, and so then as sort of a, as a follow up, um, you know, there was, you noted that sometimes the surface owners have an opportunity to, to kind of dictate what the seed mixture is. And um, my understanding is that, you know, really determined based on what they're using that land for. For example, if it's for grazing, sometimes that shorter root structure is okay. So yeah, uh, could you explain a little bit more about that as well? Yes, so a lot of times the surface owner uh, who is providing a seed mix to the operator is using that land for either a hay field or a, a grazing unit. So they can use these uh, other species and they can then, uh, they may not be as pushed into that long, long-term self-sustaining plant community as another area that would be like rangeland. So they can use those species and, and, and it can work for their, like you said, for whatever they're using that particular piece of property for. Commissioner Nanjapa, follow-up or are you good or we'll move to Commissioner Messner? Thank you. I'm good for now. I have a couple of other questions, but I'll let uh, Commissioner Messner jump in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, 
I mean, this is really important stuff and I appreciate the detail that you went into there. Um, I did have a few questions um, around what I believe would be interim reclamation, particularly around um, pipelines, flow lines, uh, those type of things. Um, and it, I mean, is it true that typically when you're doing an interim reclamation on a, a working pipeline flow line, um, that there are certain vegetations that you're trying to keep out of that area, right? So, I mean, even if this is going through, you know, a treed or forested area, you're not planting trees back on top of that pipeline because the root structures could cause integrity issues with, with the pipeline itself? Yes, I, um, typically we have not been in these areas where trees are actually being planted. Typically it's a forb, shrub, or a grass. So we don't have a lot of situations, especially on a pipeline or flow line where we're actually planting trees. Okay. Cause I was a little bit curious and I've had some experience around it, um, you know, in the Northern parts of Gunnison County. And I know there's some situations on the Western slope, although perhaps that's a different <clears throat> uh, authority that's addressing some of those interim reclamation issues. Um, but I guess I was curious a little bit about as you're looking at these pipelines and these interim reclamations, how you address stormwater or um, stormwater management or what I am also heard is that there's issues with these um, disturbed areas creating what look like de facto roads for ATVs and other recreational activities and, and how that may play into a reclamation plan um, to discourage that type of use on top of what's disturbed land. Right. Well, I, I don't think we've really addressed that directly. Um, what we would like to do is to have that pipeline not look like that pipe, like a road anymore, and get it uh, functioning properly with the vegetation that matches the surrounding vegetation. So therefore, it wouldn't be an attraction for uh, use by ATVs. But in terms of discouraging, I, we haven't been looking at that specifically. Okay. For, for, as COGCC. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Dr. Arthur. That was a great presentation. Really appreciate it, really learned a lot. Um, I'm curious about when, kind of when is reclamation done, right? Are there any post-reclamation issues um, that we face that, that may require greater attention, or is it once a final reclamation is signed off on, um, that it's kind of set it and forget it from there? So, are, are, thank you, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. So, are you asking the question about uh, once final reclamation has passed? Yes. Yes. So uh, once a reclamation inspection uh, has passed, like a, my inspector would go out and make a determination, then it's off of the COGCC list, essentially. Okay. And, and is I there think any, that was your question. No, that's exactly my question. That's, that's kind of what I was curious about. And then once you know, final reclamation has passed, has, at that point, I'm, I'm assuming it's determined that no further action is needed, that everything has been brought up to standard. Um, are there any long-term risks of that final reclamation not taking? Um, and when I say not taking, like, you know, the, the, the vegetation not, um, not sustaining or, um, you know, future weed issues or anything like that. Yeah. So at some point we have to step away once we look at it and, uh, you know, determine that it's at least per our rules, which is 80% cover um, of a reference area. So that vegetation should be stable at that point. And we don't pass locations that have weed issues or bare areas. It has to be a uniform vegetation. So our assumption at that point is, yes, it meets all these requirements and it should be self-sustaining from that point on. So we do want to wait. I, this is actually a good question because uh, we do want to, if, if we had an issue one year and they go out and spray all the weeds, we don't want to go out maybe that next growing season 
um, because it may be sustained at that point, but maybe we'll want to uh, step back um, another growing season to make sure that those weeds were quote unquote permanently taken care of. What happens in these systems is that when you have your perennial vegetation growing uh, well, they outcompete your weeds. So when you see, for instance, when you see a roadside disturbance and it gets a flush of weeds, it's because you've changed that soil profile and engaged the microbial population there uh, because you've disturbed it. And that increases your nitrogen. So then you get a flush of weeds. So once that all settles down, all that interaction between the microbes and the carbon and the nitrogen, then um, your perennial vegetation, is, well, your nitrogen uh, in the soil is going to go down and your perennials are, um, uh, what's the word for it? They, they, are, they, they do better, let's just put it that way, they do better in lower nitrogen regimes. So once you get that, that's why, why we really want that self-sustaining perennial vegetation going because it should outcompete your weeds. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, and be a good for uh, storm water. Yes. Uh, Dr. Arthur, uh, I too want to thank you for the presentation. I, I've got a question that is somewhat off topic, but I think it's on topic or it's a topic that maybe is for a different day's discussion. And it, and it just has to do with the, you know, the whole concept of surface owner variance. And, you know, I, I practice law in, in Southwest Colorado and I'm familiar with folks down there who, from a surface owner perspective, weren't necessarily uh, in line with all of the state reclamation requirements and some of the activity that happened on their land, they, they would have liked to see it sort of remain as is. For instance, the, the, you know, some of the area that is no longer for tanks, et cetera, you know, they may want to use as a parking lot for, for uh, you know, a, you, you name it, tractors, et cetera. Um, can you speak briefly about that? Or if you want to defer and we can have another discussion about that issue later, uh, I just want to kind of get it out there for myself and for our stakeholders and for our commissioners. Yes, um, that's a good question. We considered doing some of that in this presentation, uh, but it's a very large topic um, with do, you know putting it all together. So I think, um, uh, Director Murphy uh, would like us to defer that conversation um, and we'll do a full presentation on that um, down the road. That, Director that, Murphy. Thanks, Chair. That's correct. I, I thought it made a lot of sense to first set the foundation of what is reclamation, what are the principles of it, what are our end games and goals, and how do we get there, and kind of understanding the not the mechanics of it, but the techniques, right? Denise to walk through a lot of the different ways to get from an oil and gas location to uh, a successfully reclaimed um, meadow without weeds, it turns out. Um, I swear <laughs> I studied wildlife biology, Denise, um, but I'm not very good at plants apparently. Um, so, so to start there, and then the next chunk would be talking about how, how do surface variances surface owner variances fit into this? How does the subsequent use of the property fit in and how, how should we be thinking about that and um, orienting around it? Okay, that, that's fine. I just know from my days as director that that was an important um, issue and uh, I'm happy to defer it to you know, a subsequent meeting. Um, but since I did raise the topic, can you just explain what, what a surface owner variance is for everybody, and then we can defer the great broader discussion about it, you know, to another day. Julie, do you want me to answer that, or um, director? I can start if you want, and then um, I think the the principle of a surface owner variance is that, that for certain reclamation requirements, the surface owner can request a waiver of those requirements. Um, I think the the common examples that we think about is leaving an access road um, that we run into. Um, some surface owners would like to keep a compacted area of property available to turn it into some future use, whether it's for you know putting a garage on it, for example. And in thinking about those things, I think it's important to consider you know how how the local government views those future uses. So. 
I don't know, Denise, do you want to? That's, that's good enough, Director Murphy. I just didn't want to leave it out there as un, unanswered. So we will look yeah. forward to that discussion at another day. Yeah, um, just you, you did say something about as is, um, uh, Commissioner Robbins. Uh, typically, we don't uh, use an as is as a uh, variance. It, it needs to be something specific, and we do have certain rules that cannot be waived. Um, we look for weeds. We want to make sure that there's no weeds. We want to make sure that the erosion controls have been done properly. If, for instance, if a road is being left, so that it is left to the surface owner with those stormwater controls in place. Just a quick thing on that. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I will refrain from further questions along this topic. Do commissioners have questions other than surface owner variance? Commissioner Najab. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just, just a couple uh, quick um, ones related to, uh, I guess, either interim or, or final reclamation. How, uh, are there any limitations that, that we have on the use of the lands after, for example, interim reclamation? Um, and are there any, uh, you know, is there any time frame before the land can be used for other purposes? Uh, what we have to remember about interim reclamation is that it's a larger area and that the operator may need that down the road, whether it's an emergency for emergency situation or uh, you know, a workover rig. So there are various uh, reasons to keep that interim reclamation clear. Um, so we do have the situation where uh, if it's a rangeland, it may take three to five years to get good establishment of the vegetation. So if somebody, um, a landowner, might want to graze that, we have to take those things into consideration and whether um, it's going to get in the way of the operations. So we just need to make sure that the operations on those lands, are it's restored, but if oper future operations are needed, it's still there. Um, in terms of the, you'll notice on the cropland, you know, once you put that, that functional adaptive system back together, it should immediately be available to plant a crop in that and get that, um, get that going. So that use on a cropland happens almost immediately once that system is put back together, the adaptic, the soil system is put back together. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. I okay. Think that's all I have for that. Thank sure. You. Other questions from commissioners? Okay, um, I'm seeing no further questions. Thank you again, Dr. Arthur, for a great presentation and for a good Q&A session. Um, and we'll look forward to additional time with you at a meeting in the future. So again, thank you very much. Thank um, you. Our agenda has us moving into uh, a shorter presentation from uh, Dan Barbula of Bayswater for industry examples of interim reclamation at this time. Yes, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Yep, and uh, yeah, I'm Don Barbula with Bayswater and Andy Verbonitz is also gonna be speaking and um, he will be sort of guiding the presentation here. He's pulling it up now. So I guess as we get into that, uh, I, you know, we appreciate the opportunity you know, today to come present uh, some information examples on interim reclamation on some of the Bayswater sites. Um, I, I am the uh, VP of operations for Bayswater, about 40 years in the industry and the last 12 with Bayswater. Uh, when I spoke to, uh, we spoke to uh, Commissioner Nanjapa about uh, presenting some examples uh, to the commission here. Um, she had some questions about Bayswater, I'm not being familiar with that. so. 
I thought it might be a good idea if I just took a minute to uh, introduce uh, a little bit, of, tell a little bit about Bayswater and in our history here. So I'd like to start with that. Um, relative to uh, a lot of the big name players, obviously, that people are more familiar with in, in the DJ, Bayswater is a relatively small, privately funded company. Um, while being small, um, we are very active operator in both the DJ Basin as well as in the Midland Basin in Texas. Um, we raise and deploy capital uh, through a series of energy funds. Um, Bayswater was formed in 2004 and entered the DJ Basin in 2010 and over the last 10 years have been involved in drilling and operating uh, literally hundreds of wells there and been active in a, both acquiring and selling wells and lands over that 10 year period. Um, today, uh, what, do, what do our operations look like in the DJ? We've got about 22,000 uh, plus acres in Weld County. Um, the big gray area on the, the locator map there is the Greeley at the bottom of the page. So we are we are north of Greeley around the towns of Eaton and Alton Severance. Uh, today we operate about 145 uh, horizontal producing wells. Those are located primarily in the, the blue outline boxes there, um, the DSUs that are displayed there on the map. Uh, in 2020, our average production was about 8,600 barrels a day and a little over 28 million cubic feet of gas. Um, we have had a continuous one rig drilling program uh, in the basin. Uh, really for the last several years, we, we feel fortunate and thankful that we're able to remain drilling through, through 2020 and, and the pandemic and gyrations in the market there. Um, you can see where the drilling rig is currently located or as was as of last week, we are just in the process of moving that rig currently. Um, we also have operated uh, starting in November of uh, 2020 with a frack crew and the second one starting up in uh, the last two months and we are currently um, on two pads doing completion work there and you can see where those are located on that map. Um, over the course of about uh, from November until later this summer, we hope to bring on to production about uh, near over 80 new wells. Um, the um, active areas, uh, you can see we have uh, invested in our active funds. We've got two funds uh, that are currently active that we're investing capital for. Um, since 2017 in those two energy funds, we've invested almost $600 million uh, in the DJ Basin in the areas shown on this map. Um, we have an office in Eaton, Colorado, um, 16 employees there. Uh, obviously, we rely on a lot of contractor and vendor personnel and in, in addition, and in 2020, total man hours worked uh, on our properties out there were over 430,000. Um, in the last couple of years, as far as uh, impact on the, the area and the community, the, the state and county and uh, mineral owners there, we paid a little over $60 million of royalties and taxes in the state. So that gives you a little bit of uh, background on, on Bayswater. Um, we are proud to be a Colorado, part of the Colorado oil and gas industry and our operations in Weld County. Um, as a company, uh, we really do believe that the development of oil and gas uh, resources and the stewardship and protection of the environment are both achievable. And with that background, uh, following up on Dr. Arthur's great presentation on reclamation, we'll, we'll give you a couple examples of uh, Bayswater sites uh, bring your focus area back to an area just northeast um, of uh, Eaton where the rig location was. That's our Calvary Farms pad. And we will be um, showing an example of uh, some interim reclamation on that pad. I don't know, Andy, are you able to move the slide forward? 
Yeah, sure thing, sorry. There's the box. I don't know if you want to jump back there real quick. Uh, the area we're going to focus on is, is up there in that red box on our Calvary Farms pad. Thank you. So Calvary Farms, we originally permitted a North Calvary Farms and South Calvary Farms pads. Uh, they're shown on the right there, the area those were located in. We permitted 16 wells from each pad for a total of 32 wells. Uh, initially planned to develop those two sections of, uh, in the DSUs there. Um, in 2019, early 19, we moved in and drilled four wells on the northern pad and eight wells on the southern pad, and those are depicted there um, on the map with the, the green um, notations of being drilled and completed. Um, those wells were brought on in the last half of 2018 to production. Um, this was an area at the time we drilled these wells that was more or less on the, I'll say the northern fringes of development although there were a few single wells, uh, mostly north of here, there hadn't been much pad development. So we decided to move in and, and only partially develop these pads initially to see how the production would perform up there. Um, as we always do, um, we watch well performance here as well as the other pads in our area, our other wells and other operators. Um, trying to continually improve on our operations and optimize development out there. As we uh, learned over time that uh, the 32 well uh, per DSU development here was probably more densely spaced than optimum. Uh, so we re-looked at that and came back for further development on the Calvary Farms DSUs uh, and elected rather than drilling the additional 20 sites that were there in between the, the 12 wells that had been drilled there, uh, we elected to uh, move forward with eight additional wells. And with that decision, um, we were able to um, adjust the pad development uh, decision there and, and elect to only develop the remaining wells on the pad from the north pad there. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Andy and let him talk a little bit about what that allowed us to do in earlier interim reclamation on the south pad and overall uh, reduction in the disturbed area out there between the two pads. So Andy, I'm gonna turn it over to you here. Yeah, thanks, Don. Um, so yeah, I'll discuss uh, kind of the situation a little more. The next few slides I'll go into will kind of lay out some more info visually on what Don was explaining there with our drilling spacing units. Um, so as he mentioned, there are two pads, the north pad there, the Calvary North Farms on the north side and the Calvary South Farms on the south side. Um, and originally, like Don said, uh, 16 permitted wells from the north pad. Um, our original drilling and completion footprint there permitted for 6.41 acres and our interim reclamation footprint of 3.2 acres with 16 wells. And then on the south pad, uh, we have 7.3 permitted acres for drilling and completion phase with um, 3.65 acres allowable after interim reclamation, again, with 16 permitted wells off of each pad. Uh, so here's what that looks like uh, with the aerial removed. Um, as Don had mentioned, we, uh, in 2019, we drilled the four wells uh, shown in green there on the north side of the figure to kind of cover the northern portions of sections 20 and 21. And then we did eight wells off the south pad um, to cover that section. And then we left open 20 undrilled Calvary Farms permits there with the, uh, the option, the potential to go back in and infill the four to the north and eight to the south with 20 additional wells. Um, like Don mentioned, we elected uh, not to drill um, a full 20 permitted wells there. Instead, we did eight going across the middle there to infill. Uh, this is what we currently were drilling on. 
Um, and we just got done with these eight wells here uh, earlier this week. So the rig has moved on. And those are the eight wells, proximate locations of what we just got done drilling. So looking back at that, with the aerial back in now, um, outlined in blue on the left side there, you see the north pad and the south pad, um, the eight wells that were just drilled. And from a surface use perspective, uh, the innovative thing we were able to do here is um, because we didn't need as much room uh, and to drill 20 wells, we were able to drill all those eight new wells we drilled from the north pad. So again, uh, kind of make best use of that north pad. And what this allowed us to do was perform our interim reclamation on that south pad sooner than anticipated. Um, so Dr. Arthur did a great presentation um, on her reclamation processes and kind of some nuts and bolts stuff. Um, you know, um, as far as these components of interim reclamation, uh, I could probably give a whole presentation on all these different components. Um, it's, you know, a pretty detailed process, but um, for the time we have here, probably just uh, stick to some basics and kind of run through what we did here on the south pad, um, since we no longer needed that extra room for drilling. So the first component is that reduction in pad size. Um, that's, you know, the, the goal of any interim reclamation is to reduce your footprint. We no longer need that area for drilling. Uh, we don't need that space. So it's time to get that returned to uh, whatever it was previously. So uh, the yellow outline that just came up there is the acreage that we need to reclaim and kind of give back to the landowner. Um, the components of that, um, one crucial component is the landowner consultation there. The um, work with him, the selection of seed mix, um, and then what his current and future land use is. These are things that we have to keep in mind and we have to take into account, you know, it's his land, we're giving it back to him, we're done with that area, and we want to make sure we put it back how he likes it. So after that uh, reduction in pad size, um, figure out what we want to do, we consult the landowner. Uh, for this location, um, it's listed in our permitting that this is irrigated uh, crop land, although the farmer here doesn't really irrigate it, he just kind of has the option to if he chooses uses this land for um, hay production. So that's what we wanted to return them to. Uh, we worked with him and the uh, decision was made uh, by him that we'd use a dry land pasture mix in this area. So the first step is to remove that road base gravel. Um, that's done with heavy equipment, dozers, loaders, trucks. Um, we strip the pad material out of there, the gravel, and move that on, get that out of there. Um, and that's the first step in getting everything returned to interim reclamation. Once we remove that gravel, um, we're gonna recontour to natural topography and spread our segregated topsoil. Our topsoil um, is stripped, segregated, and stored there. Uh, that's the brown outline on the right side of the picture there. And uh, we need to get that spread back on. We need to regrade this area and get it back to the natural topography it was at before we were there. That's again done with heavy equipment, um, dozers, scrapers, um, get in a, a blade there, maybe a, um, an earth scraper if we need. And along with the recontouring and bringing the topsoil back in, um, like Dr. Arthur mentioned, um, we got to do a deep rip there. Uh, we do a deep rip um, to alleviate compaction, you know, um, establish good root growth, um, put some porosity back in the soil, allow moisture to penetrate or allow, allow roots to penetrate. And that's the goal of uh, doing the deep rip on this interim reclaimed area. Following that uh, deep rip and bringing the topsoil back uh, native grade, we're gonna apply seed and straw mulch during the appropriate seeding window. So 
we actually started this interim reclamation project kind of last fall, end of last summer, when it was really too hot to do seed. That uh, seeding window is kind of, it's important to is the seed your area during the appropriate time. So any time between or your first hard freeze, um, once weather cools off, but before you get that first hard freeze is a good time to seed. I like to seed in the fall as opposed to in the spring, but you can seed kind of throughout the winter, depending on if you got frozen ground or not, and then into the spring. So right about now is kind of mid-April is uh, the end of our seeding window on what we want to seed. So although we did a lot of this dirt work uh, during the summer, we kind of held off on doing the seeding um, until last fall when the weather got a little cooler. And then, uh, you know, as far as the uh, additives go and soil health, we could give a whole presentation on soil health and Dr. Arthur touched on that. Again, I'll, I'll mention your presentation a bunch because it was good and had some good detail. But um, I rely a lot on contractors for soil health um, and programs like that. Um, you know, if we need to do amendments or additives, if for some reason this location didn't start growing good grass after we seeded it, I could come back in and do some soil testing, really look at the agricultural parameters that are there in the soil and kind of have, um, have some contractors that specialize in looking at that soil, telling us what's in it, telling us what's not in it, telling us what we might need to raise or lower the pH, uh, things like that to kind of help root growth, help germination, help, uh, help soil health and kind of get established. So that's kind of um, what we do there. The, um, another thing we do um, is install straw mulch during the, uh, when we're doing our seeding. And that helps uh, both stabilize the soil keep it from running off. And then that also helps the moisture stick around. So you have, your seed has a better chance to germinate. And then at this point, the site should be more or less stabilized, um, but still we got to keep an eye on stormwater. We still inspect this site regularly on our stormwater route, um, make sure no sediment is leaving location, make sure there's no ruts forming. And just to, um, make sure we're looking good there from a stormwater perspective. And then the, the one thing that um, we always got to keep an eye on is weeds. Um, if weeds pop up, we got to mitigate them. Um, best way to uh, combat undesirable species infestations is to establish a robust, diverse native plant community. Um, and that kind of outcompetes the weeds um, and just takes up all the space that those weeds need to grow. So that's key. That's the first step before you use any herbicides or application or the best or to deal with weeds, but the best way to deal with those weeds is to establish a good, healthy native plant community. So you'll have to imagine this area outside the red line has been reclaimed um, and returned to uh, agriculture there, um, hay production. And then what we've done now is we've taken our 7.3 acre footprint and we've got that down to uh, about half, um, turned that into a 3.4 acre footprint. And then one metric I kind of like to look at a lot is kind of our acres per well. Um, so with eight wells on this pad, we were up at uh, nine tenths of an acre prior to our interim reclamation. And now post interim reclamation, uh, we got that reduced by half and we're down to about 0.4 acres per well following our interim reclamation. And here's a photo I took uh, a couple weeks ago of what that looks like. Uh, you can see our straw that's been crimped in. Uh, this photo was taken from our south pad, looking north to the north pad with the drill rig present there. Uh, the drill rig, drill rig has since moved on, but that is our um, reclaimed area. Tough to tell in this photo, but we are starting to see some grass pop up now, which is a good sign that everything went pretty well. And ideally here in uh, you know six months or maybe longer, maybe shorter, we'll uh, have this back to 
a good status. Uh, everything will be reseeded, soils will be stabilized, grass will be growing, um, and you won't be able to tell that we were ever out there. That's, that's the goal of the interim reclamation here. And then um, because those aerials were too new, um, I, and we don't have an updated version showing a post interim reclamation area. I just kind of wanted to show a similar location that we performed interim reclamation on. So on the left side of your screen there, you'll see um, drilling completion phase footprint where everything in yellow there is our um, drilling and completion phase. Um, that's the land used for that. And then on the right in green, you'll see the area that we performed interim reclamation on once we got to our production phase. We no longer needed that footprint. Um, so we reduced it and this is what we're left with. Uh, we reclaimed uh, over half of this area and returned that to uh, hay production for the landowner. Again, uh, drilling completion, we're at about 8.87 acres. And then following in our interim reclamation, uh, get back to production operations, and we're at 4.4 acres. So I thought that would be a good example to show the interim reclamation process and uh, what we do once we're uh, into that production phase. And then we thought we'd uh, just kind of close with um, a little bit on our land stewardship. Um, Don mentioned this a bunch, but um, you know, one of our, I'll just read this top line, on a daily basis, Bayswater aspires to demonstrate that oil and natural gas development can exist in partnership with environmental stewardship. So we, we take that um, very seriously, especially me with running our reclamation programs. Um, I take pride in working with the landowners, communicating with them, asking what they want in the future, talking to, to them about what their future land use is going to be. And then when we perform our interim final reclamations, we make sure to keep that in mind when we progress and do this work, you know, um, keeping those guys happy, um, leaving a positive impact with them is really important to us. Uh, doing things like this isn't just corporate lip service. I mean, we, re we really do mean this stuff, um, what we do and how we operate, you know, we want to be responsible. We are responsible. We treat this land like it's our own. Um, in fact, a lot of our employees live and work locally there in the Eaton area. They grew up there. Uh, they know a lot of these landowners on a personal level. So we source contract work locally when we can. And, um, you know, just kind of do a good job to do our part, be part of the community and, um, Keep these landowners happy with our reclamation programs. Anything else you uh, want to add on this, Don? No, I think you you covered that very very well, Andy. Thank you, and you know we'd be open to answer questions if there are some. Yep. Any questions? We're uh, more than happy to discuss, guys. Thank you. Great. Thank you both for the very informative presentation. Um, I've just got a, a, a kickoff question. Um, all the work with regard to the interim reclamation that you speak to, um, and you can speak to your company, but if you have some insight as to other companies, is, is that routinely done like in-house? Like do you have scientists and folks that know how to do this, or is this something that you subcontract out? So a lot of this work is subcontracted out. Um, we rely heavily on our contractors. Um, you know, my job necessarily is not to know everything Dr. Arthur knows. It's not to be an expert on this, but my job is to know this process well, know what's required from the state, um, and then kind of organize and formulate the plan and execute that. Um, I rely pretty heavily on contractors for their advice, for their input, and their interpretations and recommendations on what we need to do. Um, I have a few companies that help with weed mitigation. I have a few different companies that help with the soil work and the dirt work, the trucking that's associated, some heavy equipment operators, and um, I got some soil scientist companies, um, and they're all subcontracted. And you know, I work closely with them, and I rely on their 
their information and input because they're the real experts. You know, my, my background is not necessarily in reclamation. Um, it's in environmental consulting, but as far as a soil scientists go, you know, I, I don't know what Dr. Arthur knows. I don't know what these specialists know, but I listen to them and kind of work together and make sure we have a good plan to do this stuff appropriately. Great. Thank you for that. Sure. Commissioners, do we have questions? Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, nice, nice demonstrations there. Um, I'm wondering um, how, how the role of local government comes into play here and how you work with local governments. And for the most part, do you find that local governments have the kind of same reclamation requirements as the state or sometimes do they ask for different, something different? Um, do you have some thoughts about that or some examples? You know, no real examples. Uh, we work with local government a lot through for the permitting and planning processes, but as far as the reclamation stuff goes, uh, our assets and our acreage and our footprint is on private land. So I focus on dealing with those private landowners. Uh, Don may be able to touch on local government. Some yeah, I, I mean, I think that as Andy said, we, we certainly work with the local government. You know, there are, there are parts and pieces of this as far as, you know, road access and, and how that's managed obviously is heavily uh, involving the local government. The, the initial, um, you know, current process in Weld County where we operate with the, the Wogla process and that a lot of these uh, overall uses of the land and, and footprint and, and stormwater, et cetera, you know, there's a lot of that addressed in those permitting processes as well. But I wouldn't say we, as Andy said, there's a lot of involvement maybe in this reclamation piece per se, because it is primarily geared towards the sort of the, the state rules and, you know, making sure those are um, taken into account along with the landowner concerns and, and um, preferences there that the, where those can match, so. Commissioner Nijopper. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much uh, for the presentation. It was uh, great to see some of the examples that you've provided. And, um, you know, I asked you this when, when we just talked before the presentation, but um, I think it'd be helpful for other folks to, to hear. I, I um, you know, was interested in the fact that a, a business decision related to the number of wells you were drilling, um, you know, then influenced your um, actions towards taking on the interim reclamation. And, and um, I just wanted you to, you know, kind of explain, was that is that something in your just typical practice that once you make that sort of business decision that you'll just go forward with the interim reclamation or is there any prompting from COGCC or other entity that causes you to go forward with that interim reclamation? Um, and, you know, yeah, I'll have a follow up after that, but I'll let you answer that part first. Yeah, well, sure. I, I'm, I was gonna say, I'll let Andy answer that in general as, as far as how the timing and looking at that is evolves, but yeah, sure. I would say to answer your question, um, it, the answer is both, really. I mean, um, interim rec so following our drilling and subsequent drilling operations, we're required uh, to reclaim or perform interim reclamation uh, within three months on cropland and six months on non-cropland. So that's part of the driver. But then, you know, plans change and schedules change and where we send the drill rig next can sometimes change. And this, this example we showed today, it certainly probably isn't the last time that our schedule and plans are gonna change. So when that happens, we all kind of huddle up and make sure we're covered um, compliance wise. So I guess to answer your question, um, yeah, just from a compliance perspective, we're required to start that interim reclamation a certain time period after we're done with the larger footprint. And then again, it's just the right thing to do. Um, I communicate with the landowners about our plans and our future and what we're gonna do. And then um, tell them when things change and 
I say, hey, we no longer need this larger footprint on the south pad. We were able to drill all these wells from the north pad. So we're gonna proceed with interim reclamation. Um, let's start the process. Let's start the talk and uh, see what you'd like to get out of it. And we'll go from there. Yeah, great. Thank you. I, I appreciate that because I know, you know, at least there are some instances, I don't, I, I can't really speak to how frequently it occurs where, you know, it, uh, uh, it uh, an action from COGCC has been required to um, ensure that, that an operator has, has met their compliance. So it's, it's, you know, great to see these examples of when you're kind of just on your own, you know, making sure you're, you're checking all the boxes and, and doing what you need to do um, without any prompting. Um, the other piece of that I was just curious about is how did you, what went in, what kind of factors went into your determination of, of how much um, acreage you were going to need to continue um, your operations, you know, so how did you make that determination on um, reducing your footprint and, and is it typically as, you know, is your approach sort of as small as possible or is it, you know, are there different factors that come into play? There's definitely different factors that come into play. Um, you know, the, so we, on our permitting form 2A, we say our drilling and completion footprint, and then we have an interim reclamation footprint uh, acreage. And so that, that acreage, we got to get down to that acreage no matter what, even if that acreage was an underestimate, we got to find a way to get down to that point. Um, other than that, we can, we can usually actually take it a bit lower than that acreage. Um, I start by talking with our production foreman and I say, hey, here's, here's the plan we're thinking of. Does this work for you? What kind of space do you need? Um, is this enough room to get the workover rig in when you need to do well work? Um, and he might tell me that, oh yeah, this plan works good. I'm good with your footprint. But instead of reclaiming this little piece on the west side, can we leave that as pad area and instead you reclaim this other little piece over here on the east side, uh, for an example, that's kind of a conversation we have before we get going with it. Yeah, I guess I, I would add, thank you, Andy, I would add to that, the, you know, just there's a lot of planning as, as was described there up front and trying to come up with what, what initial disturbed areas necessary for drilling and completion operations and then you know, with facility layouts, um, how much area are we going to need afterwards and taking into account, you know, certainly some safety things on having fired vessels so far away from, from storage tanks, etc. There are some, some practices and requirements that, that uh, are necessary there to sort of lay out that facility and, and come up with a footprint and what, what we can um, operate safely and well and efficiently and after um, we go to the production phase and accounting for maybe f compression, added compression that might come later, et cetera. So th there's a lot of upfront work that, that goes into trying to lay that out to come up with a, a, a good number to minimize impact, but still have enough for safe, efficient operations. Thank you for those answers. Uh, further questions from commissioners? Okay, great. I'm not seeing any. So we want to thank you again for the presentation and for the introduction of your company to us. Um, that is helpful. Um, so at this point, um, we are at our lunch break. We're about 45 minutes early, it being 1058. Um, and we're going to go into executive session to receive legal advice and analysis regarding the proposed MOU between COGCC and Weld County. Um, so at this point, I think we can allow Mr. Verbonitz and Barbula to um, zoom away. Thank you again for Great. being with us. Yep. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. Appreciate the time. It's nice to get in front of you, at least virtually. Yeah, exactly. We'll look forward to seeing you guys in person at some point, we hope. Um, thank so you much. It being um, 11 a.m., I believe we are to seek a motion to move into executive session. And um, we've got it scheduled for an hour, so we would return 
to this Zoom meeting at noon. Um, AAG Davenport, uh, do you have any advice, guidance, next steps for us? Mr. Chair, I just need to read my script um, okay. pursuant to open meetings law. Commissioners, uh, pursuant to open meetings law, this commission is entitled to enter into an executive session at this meeting for the purpose of receiving legal advice pursuant to Colorado Rock Statute Section 246-4023A, Roman 2. The topic for this executive session was identified on the agenda. It is to receive legal advice and analysis regarding the proposed memorandum of understanding between the COGCC and Weld County. Mr. Chair, I invite you to encourage a motion to enter into executive session for the purposes I just relayed. So encouraged. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. We will move into executive session. For our stakeholders, um, so what we'll do is we will exit this Zoom meeting and we will enter a Zoom, a different Zoom that is our executive session Zoom, and then we will reconvene here in approximately one hour uh, at noon. Um, and so we'll see you then. And uh, thank you very much for participating with us this morning, and we'll look forward to seeing you in an hour. Welcome back everybody. Uh, this is the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission uh, and we are back live. We have concluded our executive session and I would turn to Assistant Attorney General Kyle Davenport for next steps. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioners, we do need a motion to exit executive session. Now that you have returned from executive session, during the executive session, the commission received legal advice on the item that was identified on today's agenda. That was to receive legal advice regarding the proposed memorandum of understanding between the COGCC and Weld County. No decisions were made during that executive session and no votes were taken during that executive session. Mr. Chair, I invite you to incur I invite you to encourage a motion to exit executive session. So encouraged. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to exit executive session. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, I believe we are now out of executive session. AG Davenport, did you have anything more at this point or can we move to the next agenda item? Nothing further other than to offer screen sharing if you need that at any point in time for this MOU. Yeah, I think that would be great. Um, so uh, commissioners, we now have before us consideration of memorandum of understanding between Weld County, Colorado and COGCC. Um, I can take the liberty of introducing the topic to commissioners. Um, as you know, um, I was, my, my COGCC employment started with me being director at the commission for a year and a half and um, following uh, in, in that capacity and after Weld County uh, adopted its 1041 regulations, uh, which is a new set of regulatory authority allowed to local governments when they regulate the land use and surface aspects of oil and gas. Um, 
I, as director then, uh, in consultation with staff and, and others, uh, felt it made sense for the commission and Weld County to have a memorandum of understanding that uh, was a process document to establish how, uh, and, uh, how the state and, and how Weld County would both process the, their independent authority to permit oil and gas. Um, and so we entered into that in initial uh, memorandum of understanding, I believe in September of 2019. Um, since that time, and as you're well aware, um, COGCC has adopted its mission change rules. Um, well County has, I believe, um, uh, amended its regulations. And so I entered into some discussions with Well County um, over the course of the last several months to potentially uh, allow Well County and this commission to amend the original MOU since the processes uh, in particular at the state had changed. Um, and so that's the document that you have before you today for consideration. Um, <clears throat> it essentially um, establishes for operators for Well County and for our commission um, the uh, process by which commission will and well county staff will coordinate with each other the dual independent regulatory authority that exists for each jurisdiction. It also um, provides a template for operators so that they can understand how uh, they can potentially successfully obtain the weld oil and gas location permit, the WOGLA permit, uh, as well as obtain an OGDP, the Oil and Gas Development Plan permit uh, from commission. It establishes a commitment on the part of our staff to uh, be early on involved in the, uh, both the pre-application process at Well County for their WOGLA permit, as well as to provide substantive comment to Well County during the WOGLA permit process. Um, it also um, establishes um, that if an operator is going to um, undertake a comprehensive area plan, um, as well as a comprehensive drilling plan at Well County, that the, our jurisdiction in Well County will suggest that it makes sense for the operator to come to the commission first under our newly developed comprehensive area plan um, uh, protocol. Um, and then finally, and I think importantly, it, it uh, retains or demonstrates that uh, both the Weld County permitting process and our permitting process are, are independent and we each retain our, our independent authority to review new oil and gas locations um, to, uh, and that we have not waived any authority uh, by entering into this document. Um, I think that the um, amended weld MOU um, is a good step for both our commission, our staff, for Weld County, and for um, citizens and stakeholders and operators within Weld County. I think it serves as a guidepost to how to uh, coordinate the WOGLA permitting process and how to um, undertake the oil and gas development plan process at, at our state agency. Um, and so um, with that, um, I wanna thank our staff for their involvement in negotiating um, this proposed amended MOU. Um, uh, I'm available to answer questions because I was involved in negotiations. Uh, AAG Davenport is available to answer any questions from a, from a legal perspective. I can inform you that uh, Weld County commissioners took up this document this morning uh, and um, with the exception of a couple of typos, um, they have now approved the document. Um, I might have AAG Davenport explain the couple of typos that would be changes from the document that was posted as being final um, for us this morning. Um, but that's my... Uh, that's my overview um, of the document that's before us. 
Mr. Chair, is it appropriate to discuss those two typos now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Why don't we do that and then we can open it up for questions from commissioners. Thank you. I will share my screen. Commissioners, this is the document that Weld County approved this morning. The um, typos are relatively minimal, I believe. And let me briefly pull up exactly what they are so I don't misstate them. It's just a couple of things in the introduction section of the agreement. The first one is, let's see, there is a scheduled in the first paragraph, use of the word scheduled, let me highlight that. This was changed to, from scheduled to scheduled. Sorry, that's in the agreement section of it. And then up in the second paragraph, third sentence, added this OGDP to state the acronym for the first time and it wasn't previously stated in the document. Thank you, AEG Davenport, for sharing your screen on that front. Um, but I'm trying to get to a point where I can see everybody, uh, which is not the case at this point. Does anybody have questions for anyone or comments? Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a uh, question first and then I'll make a comment. Um, so my understanding is, is that uh, although this uh, MOU does reference an, an exhibit A that is a waiver that is written in the English language, that there would be nothing in this document that would uh, disallow the translation of that English document, that, uh, that waiver in any other language besides English to ensure that whoever's signing that waiver fully understands what is written. AAG Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Messner, I agree with that statement. Your understanding is correct. Should, the C, should you, the commission, instruct the staff to translate this document into another language, Spanish or any other, nothing in this agreement or the attachment to the agreement prevents that translation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so as, as a former county commissioner, you know, I do realize the value of collaboration between state and local governments. Uh, and, I, and I think that having this partnership and process permit, permitting uh, at the state and local level uh, does demonstrate how we are meeting the spirit of SB 19181 to recognize local government's involvement in regulating the surface impacts of oil and gas development, while also acknowledging the independent COGCC permitting process. Um, so I do uh, appreciate the work that Chairman Robbins and AAG Davenport and staff have put into uh, developing this collaborative process uh, and uh, uh, support it. Other questions or comments from commissioners? Commissioner Gonzalez? Uh, not a question, Chair Robbins. And, um, you know, I, I've read this MOU thoroughly and along with the exhibit I attached um, for the informed consent document. And, um, you know, I appreciate the work that, uh, that you put in with the with Weld County to, to get this done. Uh, you know, this is a collaborative approach to the permitting process between, between this commission and Weld County. And I think it fulfills a, a beneficial aim of, of both proactive and protective permitting by operators working in Weld County. Um, I'm encouraged to see it. I'm encouraged by this approach. Um, look forward to seeing it work in practice. 
Thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez. Further questions, comments? If not, do we have a motion to approve the amended MOU with Well County? So moved. Again. We have a motion and a second. Um, before we vote, I'd, I'd like to, to make a statement. Um, you know, COGCC is working to implement the spirit and mandates of 19181, um, which changed the mission at the commission from fostering to regulating in a protective manner. And also the statute allows local governments uh, a uh, expanded role in regulating uh, surface and land use impacts of, of oil and gas development and production. Um, I think this agreement creates a, a collaborative process for protective permitting and ensuring that uh, our largest um, uh, jurisdiction with oil and gas production and the state government work collaboratively together. Um, and I think this is an important agreement uh, and process for COGCC as we work with Well County. Um, and I finally want to um, thank our staff for the efforts that they went into this. I, I thank staff for the efforts that are going to be required under this document. Um, and I also want to send a thank you to Well County, uh, its uh, commissioners, um, its attorney Bruce Barker um, and Jason Maxey, who runs their oil and gas department, um, for the um, efforts that, that they undertook to um, work with us and them to achieve uh, the language contained within this MOU and the process uh, for us. Um, I'm hopeful that this will be a, a protective um, and collaborative process for the state, uh, Well County, uh, its operators and the stakeholders uh, for that community. So with that, uh, seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion to approve the COGCC Well County amended MOU signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, um, with that, we are to commissioner comments section of the agenda. Does anybody have comments for ourselves and for our stakeholders that are listening in? Uh, I saw Commissioner Gonzalez first and then Commissioner Messner. Um, just as usual, a, a big thank you to, uh, to the preparation that went into today's presentations. Um, Dr. Arthur, um, as well as the presenters from Bayswater, and thank you to Commissioner Nanjapa for, um, for ringleading this uh, presentation today. Um, very beneficial, and I look forward to continuing the conversation on reclamation um, as it moves forward. Here, here. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and ditto to what Commissioner Gonzalez said, but um, yeah, I mean, as always, uh, good presentations. I just was going to give folks a little bit of a update on what I've been working on um, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I have been meeting uh, weekly with a number of different uh, counties to give them updates on our mission change rulemaking and our upcoming rulemakings. And over the last couple of weeks, I've had the opportunity to chat with Route County, Larimer County, Cheyenne County, Yuma County, um, uh, Elbert County, Gunnison County, Pickin County, Arapahoe County, and I'm forgetting some, but, uh, but they've all been really good conversations. People are really interested. They're appreciative of the conversations and uh, are you know, across the board interested in working closely with the COGCC uh, on you know, oil and gas permitting operations moving forward and continuing a collaborative approach. And so uh, I've been really pleased with those conversations. So uh, just a little update on that. Excellent. Thank you, Commissioner Messner. And, and and as I mentioned, I too am doing some of that, not nearly to the extent that, that you are, but I've met with uh, Garfield County, La Plata County, Los Animas County, um, the town of Erie, and I will be meeting with Boulder County tomorrow evening. Any further comments? Commissioner Hackett. Thank you, Chair Robbins, and I don't want to cut off any additional comments from voting commissioners if they wanted to 
go first, but I did want to share um, a couple updates from, CO, uh, from CDPHE. Um, first, talking about ongoing efforts to minimize emissions. So we're all aware that combating the climate crisis will be an economy-wide effort that will require deep emission cuts from the oil and gas industry, as well as personal efforts on behalf of all of us. Um, and just wanted to make a reminder for folks that the formal rulemaking effort um, to minimize emissions, greenhouse gas emissions from the oil and gas industry, that will be from September to December at the Air Quality Control Commission. Um, and leading up to that, the Air Pollution Control Division has had several public rulemaking or public stakeholder processes that included public comments. Um, and they've also been in close coordination and will continue to coordinate with COGCC staff on these issues. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that folks are aware of a parallel process that's going on at CDPHE. Um, actually, right now, as we speak, the Air Pollution Control Division is holding a stakeholder process about minimizing emissions from the transportation sector. Um, so that's something that folks can tune in on if they're interested. From the Air Pollution Control Division's website, there's a planning and policy um, or public public outreach section that people can register for this for. And then another thing that I wanted to share with folks, it's a recent hiring decision that we're all very excited about. And I just wanted to pass along um, CDPHE's executive director, Jill Hunsaker Ryan, just announced um, a replacement for John Putnam, who previously filled the environmental programs director position. Uh, we're excited to have a gentleman by the name of Sean McGrath, who will be joining our team. Some of you may know him or be familiar with him. Uh, Sean is coming to us from Montana, where he was the director of the Department of Environmental Quality there. Before that, he served as the US Environmental Protection Agency's regional administrator out of, um, based out of Denver. And then before that, he, does, he had um, local government experience serving as the mayor and city councilor of the town of Boulder. Um, and at, at least in the short term and, and probably the long term as well, I'll still likely represent CDPAG on this commission, but um, at some point, Mr. McGrath will likely want to introduce himself to you all and may want to play a role. So we're really excited to have him and just wanted to share that news with folks. And that's all I had. Great, thank you, Commissioner Hackett. Um, and we will look forward to an introduction with uh, Mr. McGrath um, after he gets his feet under him. Uh, big shoes to fill there, um, for sure. Other commissioner comments? All right, seeing none, I think we have successfully concluded our agenda. Uh, great work, everybody. Um, and we will uh, look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We are adjourned. Have a great, great day, folks.